good afternoon, any, everyone. At least it's afternoon for us here, maybe not for you. It's a very international course. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome you all and tell you a little bit more about the Masters of Studies in English Language Assessment. Um, just to start with, to say a bit more about what it's actually, what we're actually aiming to teach you in, in this um, course, should you be interested to, to take it. Um, so our aim is to help you to understand and apply the, uh, the rigorous principles that are required to adjust and adapt assessment tools um, so that you will, will be better able to meet the diverse needs of learners and candidates um, and to ensure fairness across different learning and testing environments. Um, and finally, um, if you're successful um, in doing this course and should you be interested in um, doing further research in the area, um, then if you're successful with a high grade, then you um, may be allowed to progress to a PhD um, either here at our university or it will give you access uh, to similar degree programs at other universities. So that's in brief what our main aims are. Now, what would you learn if, were you to sign up for our course? First of all, our first module, we have six different modules. The first module focuses on um, developing your understanding of speech and language and how they are learned. Um, then in the second module, we focus on language learning more specifically um, and language learning in instructive contexts. Then in the, first, first, in the third module, we really focus on assessment by covering the various principles that are key um, in assessment and how assessment contributes um, to language learning. Then in the fourth module, we'll cover um, various ways in which technology can be used in learning and assessment. Um, and the fifth module focuses on the methodology um, that you will need to acquire, um, both in order to be able to carry out the research that you would be carrying out on the course, but hopefully also in the shape of transferable um, skills that you will be able to apply in your professional practice in the future, or should you want to continue with research that you can apply there. And statistical analysis is, of course, a very important part of that. And then finally, um, we will give you a, a critical view of assessment tools in the sixth module. And Graham's um, talk is related to that, I think, today. Now, as you can see, perhaps from the variety of um, topics that we cover in the modules, we really need a, a quite an interdisciplinary team to cover all of those aspects. So we've only been able to, to develop this course because we work very closely together with various um, partners. So first of all, of course, the Institute of um, Continuing Education. Um, but crucially, um, also uh, Cambridge University Press and Assessment, uh, which is Graham's um, base actually, um, but also with the Cambridge Language Sciences, which is um, a, a virtual research centre that unites um, researchers from across the university who work on language with language, um, including myself. I'm one of the co-directors of this research institute um, and in linguistics. So many of our linguists who are part of that research centre um, take part in teaching this course. So in terms of teaching and uh, assessment, our approach is um, to use blended learning with online and face-to-face -face teaching from experts from across this broad range of disciplines that I've just uh, referred to already. Um, and the face-to-face -face teaching, and that is part of that course, um, is carried out during um, two-week uh, residential sessions, two of them. Um, we combine uh, in-depth theoretical learning with practical tasks here, um, both in the online, um, but especially in the face-to-face -face residential sessions. Um, and then in terms of assessment um, on the course, we have various different modes of assessment. First of all, we have asked um, students to write essays to assess um, their learning on modules um, one to three. Um, then we have assignment tasks that are linked to module four. Um, and a 3000 word essay that's related to your research proposal or your dissertation with information from other modules. And then finally, the biggest part of it is um, the research project that you will be, would be undertaking um, yourself um, and write up in the shape of a dissertation at the end um, of the course. 
key dates. Um, if you're interested to apply, um, then keep your eye on the deadline of 21st of August, 2023. Um, the course would begin on the 5th of January, 2024 and ends on the 1st of January, 2026. Um, if that's a little bit too soon for you, we will have another cohort starting um, about nine months later in September 2024, um, which you can keep your eye on as well. And then we have um, the impersonal residential sessions, should you want to do the course next year, um, in March um, 24 and March and early April in 2025. I think, I don't know if I, there was another, yep, okay. So a key thing to bear in mind is here really that you and your fellow students would be the greatest resource on the course. Of course, you will be collaborating with professionals that work at the frontiers of language assessment, but it is really your interaction with your fellow students and of course with those professionals, um, with people from across the world, with very different experiences, Different, different reasons for doing the course, different professional backgrounds um, that will that will be an important part of um, of your development in in the field. Um, it would also, of course also allow you to diversify your professional networks, and uh, together with the staff, we would leverage um, our collective knowledge to make a success of your learning on the course. And as I mentioned. Um, should you be interested to proceed to do further research, then the, the MST might give you an entrance to a PhD programme. Then just to close off my bit of the presentation, um, you can have a one-to-one -one session with our course director, Dr. Um, Roberto Sileo, um, if you would like to know more about the course and the details of it, um, but also maybe explore your own interests and how well they fit with what we offer. Um, and there are sorts available, as you can see, in early and late July. And there is um, a link in the chat um, that you can use um, to book yourself um, in for one of those slots, should you be interested. Thank you. I think that was all for me. Great, thanks very much, Brescia. Um, so I will take over now and uh, welcome you. Uh, as Brescia said, I come from Cambridge Assessment and I'm a senior research manager there. And I also um, participate in the course and lead some of the, the sessions in module six. So I'm delighted that you're joining me today and uh, I'm going to talk you through this talk. What's the recipe for a good English language test? And I hope it will be interesting and stimulating for you. So the aims of what I'm going to talk to you about today is to give you a very broad overview of the content of module six of the Masters in English Language Assessment. And as we look at the content, we will consider both the theoretical, but also very much the practical aspects of developing an appropriate English language assessment. So it's quite practical, uh, this sixth module, which I, I think is a strength. And obviously, we, we put the underlying theory in there as well. And of course, my aim is to whet your appetite to, to learn more and to ultimately sign up to the Masters if you're interested. So I'll speak for about 40 minutes, but then there will be a time for questions and answers after that. So do put your questions, any questions that you, that you have in the chat or in the Q&A section here on Zoom, and we'll make time at the end to answer those questions, whether it's about the course itself or whether it's about uh, things that I'm talking to you about today. So please make use of that. Put your questions in any time and we'll come to those at the end. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to start with my daughter's birthday cake. Um, now, a couple of weeks ago, my daughter had her eighth birthday um, and uh, I had to fairly hurriedly make a birthday cake for her on her actual birthday. She had a party with all her friends at on another day, but on her actual birthday, uh, she rightly wanted a birthday cake. Now, in order to make a cake, uh, we have to ask ourselves certain questions. We can't just make a cake like that. Um, these are 
are fairly fundamental questions that maybe you don't even consciously think about. But when you're making a cake, you do think about who is this cake for? Uh, what sort of occasion is it for? Who will eat it? How many people will eat it? And therefore, how big the cake needs to be? What do the eaters like? What tasty things are we going to put in the cake? What flavours will the cake have? Do the people who will eat it, do they have any allergies that we need to be aware of? And importantly for me on my daughter's birthday, how much time do I realistically have to make the cake? Uh, what ingredients do I already have in the cupboard? And which of those ingredients that are essential for the cake do I not have and I need to go to the shop to buy? Well, those are very important questions uh, to help me decide what sort of cake I ended up baking uh, for my daughter. She said she wanted quite a simple sponge cake, but with a bit of marzipan. That's that almond flavour on top. Uh, and she definitely wanted candles. Fair enough. So uh, I fairly quickly put together this cake, which, as you can see, isn't exquisite, isn't wonderful, but it certainly served the purpose for what my daughter wanted on her birthday. And so that's the analogy I want to compare with when we are thinking about how we go about creating and developing and running language tests or language assessments. Um, and there are certain questions that we have to ask ourselves when we are thinking about developing a language assessment. And some of those are, are listed here. So we need to think about well, what type of language test is needed. We need to think about what's the underlying construct of the test. And that's quite a, a, a jargony sort of word. Basically, what it means is what do we want to measure? What's the underlying principles underpinning the test? What do we actually want to measure in our language test? Very important question, who do we want to test? Who exactly is going to be taking this test? What do we know about them? Who is our target candidature? And why do they need a test in the first place? And to do that, we need to carry out some needs analysis to see what our candidates or our would-be candidates, what do they actually need? Why do they need to prove their English language ability at this moment in time in this context? And in order to understand that, we often need to have a look at what is our target language use domain, our TLU domain. And what that means is, as we look at our prospective candidates for our test and the needs, why they are taking this test, we need to think about the actual language that we want to test. And often, in almost all cases, that needs to be authentic of actual language that they are using or that we want them to use in the real world. And that's a concept that I'll come back to. So we think about all of those things as we try to develop a language test. And we also very much think about the resources that we have or we might not have and that also our candidates have and might not have. And that influences as well the sort of language test that ultimately we develop. So there is not one sort of cake. There are many, many, many different sorts of uh, cakes uh, in the world out there and different purposes as to what sort of cake you want to bake results in different sorts of cakes, different flavours for different purpose. And again, that's the same with our tests. So tests are fit for purpose depending on the answers to these questions and other questions that we might ask ourselves when we are thinking about how to develop our test. Now, therefore, different test purposes results in different tests. And so the question we have to ask ourselves as we develop a test is, is that test fit for purpose? And the word that we often use in the literature about that is, is the test valid? Is there validity in the test? Um, can we present evidence for that validity to show that it is uh, valid, it is fit for purpose, and therefore it's it's worth running that test. And we do that because often 
uh, the tests are used to make decisions. And we don't create a test for the fun of it. There's a purpose behind that test, as I've already said. And that purpose is often to do with how the results of that test is used in decision making. So this is what happens typically in some form of language assessment, that students or candidates, test takers perform tasks and the tasks provide information about the student's language ability. Students get scores for how well they perform those tasks. And based on those scores, we make inferences about each student's ability to use the target language. We're making inferences because a test and assessment usually only gives a snapshot of a person's language ability at that moment in time. So therefore we have to extrapolate that and uh, assume their wider language ability is going to be uh, based on representative of their performance in the language assessment. And therefore, based on these beliefs about their ability levels, we are able to make decisions uh, and we'll come on to the sorts of decisions that we might make using language assessments in a minute. So let's try and answer or consider how we might answer some of those questions that I showed you before. Maybe firstly, we want to think about what sort of language test we want to bake, we want to create, we want to develop and we want to run. And there are different sorts of language tests and uh, we can categorize them into these four categories. Um, there are some other categories as well. And uh, one test can cover a mixture of these categories, but just to give you a flavour of some of the types of language tests that we might create. We might create a proficiency test, and, and that is to check uh, whether a candidate is proficient in language as a whole, and therefore a candidate would take a proficiency test not knowing exactly which language might be in this test, so we're testing language as a whole, hopefully relevant to their level, but it's not targeted on, on specific language. And we want to reward the candidate ultimately. The aim is to maybe give them a certificate to say, yes, you are at this particular level of English, and they can therefore use that as evidence to take to an employer or um, for further study purposes. Another sort of language test is a placement test, and that is a test that uh, teachers in classrooms will often do maybe at the beginning of a course, and they will test language as a whole, a, a representative sample of language as a whole, and the point of why they are doing this assessment is to be able to place uh, their students at different levels to put them in classes appropriate to their learning needs. Thirdly, we have an achievement test, uh, and that is often used in classroom assessments to check that candidates have achieved, have learnt, have assimilated the language that they have been using in class, and to maybe give them a certificate to say, yes, you've passed this particular class in English language. And so unlike the proficiency test, the language that's being tested is specifically designed to that curriculum that the class has been following or, or specific lessons within the class that they have been doing. Or another type of language test is a diagnostic test where we assess a candidate's language ability in order to inform teachers usually about what their future learning needs might be and they can plan okay well this group of students might be weaker at maybe this particular point of grammar and therefore this test has informed me as a teacher what to focus on for this learner or this group of learners. Now, as I said, obviously, you can use one test to maybe do a range of these different things, but it's important to, first of all, work out, well, what's, what's the ultimate point of the language test that you want to create? Secondly, then, we need to think about what's the construct. So what 
do we actually want to test? And there are many theories that are in the literature about how we go about doing this. What's the underlying theory behind what we want to test? Nowadays, in language assessment, in English language assessment, we generally, most language testing organisations and most language testing follow some sort of communicative model. And this emerged in the 80s and the 90s in particular, uh, and these are notable authors in this area, uh, who put forward the idea that we shouldn't just test grammar in isolation or translation of strange phrases, we need to be testing language that actually helps communication, that promotes real communication between uh, the learner and other people that they will meet or situations that will be in. And this model uh, developed during the, the 90s in particular, and then incorporated elements of authenticity. So making sure that we are testing language that is actually going to be authentic. It's going to be representative of real world scenarios that those candidates will find themselves in or indeed our, are finding themselves in at the moment. And then recently or more recently since then, we've been thinking about how other factors uh, come into play as well. And so we're put forward his social cognitive framework, thinking about how social factors, how cognitive factors also have very much an effect on the linguistic. And we need to bear that in mind in our assessments as well. So ultimately, and this is this is my uh, conclusion of uh, the underlying construct that we generally speaking have uh, in English language assessment nowadays is that we want to assess an English learner's ability to communicate in real world tasks. And more often than not, these are mock real world tasks because they're in a specific testing environment at that moment in time, but they are representative of real world tasks. And we bear in mind the social and the cognitive aspects of communication as well as the linguistic. Now, that model has been developed in many different ways, and I could talk more about that. Uh, but fundamentally, that's sort of where we're at now in terms of English language assessment that most people tend to agree with. And then we can narrow down our test a bit further and say, OK, so we're thinking about uh, real life uh, language assessment. So what is the, the real life authentic language assessment that is relevant for our learners at the moment? Probably it's using English in a range of different tasks. And we often split English language, indeed language as a whole, when we're learning into these four skills, listening, reading, writing and speaking. Um, that model is itself being challenged at the moment, but generally speaking, that is a, a very widely recognised way of categorising language into the four skills, listening, reading, writing and speaking. It may be that we want to focus in only on one of those skills, on the speaking ability, for example. It may be that we want to drill down even further into one of those skills, into subskills. So, for example, pronunciation, which is a subskill of speaking. Or it may be that we want to specifically look at the learner's ability to use specific grammar and vocabulary as part of those skills. And we do actually want to focus on grammar and vocab explicitly rather than implicitly part of one of those skills. And then we need to think about what type of English do we want to test? Are we testing English generally speaking? Or are we drilling down a bit into English for specific purposes? So that may be English for academic purposes. If you want to go and study at a university at some point later, we, we may want to focus on the sorts of academic language that's used in universities rather than general purposes. Or we want to look at English for work purposes or migration purposes, or if uh, somebody's getting a job as a nurse or a doctor, English in the healthcare area. 
air traffic control is a particularly interesting case study. Uh, air traffic control uses English as its language of global communication wherever you are in the world. Um, and that has a very specific set of vocabulary and lexical items that we need to focus on if you're interested in assessing that. It's obviously very important. You want F air traffic controllers and pilots to uh, to have a very good concept of English to be able to understand one another when they're flying planes, as for example. Or international business, so English in that business context. Uh, as we know, English is a very useful language worldwide for many reasons, particularly in business. So that's just some examples. And we are thinking about the purpose of the test because we're thinking about the candidates themselves. And remember, those candidates are learners. Candidates are always learners in some context. So who is the test for? Who is our cake for? So obviously, there are many different sorts of people who are wanting to take an English test from the six-year-old who's just started learning English. And there are some other examples on there. Uh, people who are uh, wanting it for work purposes, people are wanting it for study purposes, people who are uh, teenagers, that bottom example there, who is going on a summer school. Uh, so that they're, they're teenagers, they want to be motivated uh, by enjoying a nice summer in Malta. Uh, they need a different sort of test as they're arriving. They probably need some sort of placement test to the six-year-old who may want a very simple, child-friendly, uh, with lots of pictures, achievement test on the first few things that they've learnt to, let's say, our student wanting to migrate to study at postgraduate level in Australia, who needs quite an intense uh, test, uh, which is internationally recognised, recognised by the government in Australia and probably focuses on uh, migration and or academic aspects within the content of the test. So different candidates need different content and quite probably different formats of the test as well. And we'll have a look at those a bit in a minute. So all of that affects the content of the test, as I said, and the format of the test. How do we know what ingredients we want to put in our test? Now, there are many ways of trying to work out what the content is, um, and I'd like to just highlight one particular useful uh, method or framework that lots of English language tests nowadays use, and that's the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, the CEFR, that you may have heard of. It was published, uh, first of all, in 2001, and then a companion volume was released a couple of years ago. And that is a widely used framework. It's not the only one, uh, but it is quite a widely used one that we can use to help us work out what might go in the language test. And it uses that communicative, action-oriented model of language that I was talking about before. So very much focused on how people can actually use the language in real life. I'm obviously not going to go into everything that's in the CEFR because it's quite a comprehensive document, um, but you can see roughly how it categorizes language into different areas. Um, so in the linguistic area, sociolinguistic, pragmatic area, which covers uh, some of these building blocks of the language. And then on the right hand side, some of the skills that are used uh, in language, so listening, reading, writing and speaking. And they, the CFR talks about reception, so receiving language production, being able to produce the language interactions, so having a conversation, for example, um, and something called mediation, which I haven't got time to go into today, but I can certainly talk more about if you like. But basically what the CFR does is it categorizes language into these scales and then it gives you a little table, a little framework uh, that you can use and take in order to help formulate what you need to cover in an assessment at a certain level. So in the CFR, there are many of these scales. So the one you see on screen, and apologies, it's quite small, is about overall written production. So we have a scale. 
And then on the left hand side, we have different ability levels, starting at pre A1 and A1 for the weakest learners or, the, or those learners who are just starting their language learning journey. Often these are children, but not always. Um, and going up to C1, C2, that's the most proficient learners. And then for each of the levels, there are descriptors which give um, an illustration of what sort of language could be covered at that level in that particular scale. And that can help language assessors um, to, to give them an idea of what sort of things we might cover in an assessment that wants to target certain things here, written production, at a certain level. Um, I could talk for hours about the CFR, but I'm not going to. But that hopefully gives an idea of how we go about finding the right content for a, a test. And we can obviously change the wording of those descriptors to suit our particular context. So then what tools can we use to bake our language tests? How, what's the format? What sort of task types might we use within our test? And obviously the first thing to say is that generally speaking, we can divide our tools between uh, tests that happen on paper, pen and paper, and tests that happen online and tests that happen often with speaking in an actual face-to-face -face environment. Uh, so there are, are these sort of three different formats that can be changed and adapted in many different ways. But ultimately, firstly, that's a decision we need to make about how and where a candidate will take a particular test. Now let's have a look at some task types that we might use in our language tests. And we're going to start off with some examples of reading task types, and then we'll move on to some examples of speaking task types, just to give you an idea of how we might do that. So let's have a look at uh, reading. Uh, we can see on the screen here two different types of reading uh, task types. The top one here, the candidate needs to simply select the real English word in this list of uh, vocab items. So this test is simply testing the ability to recognize words just at that level of, of one unit, the word, and to identify whether that's a real English word or not. Now, you need to ask yourself, how useful is this task type? It is useful in certain contexts uh, because it focuses on the word level, it focuses on spelling, but what about those other non-English words? Is that actually useful? Might it confuse candidates because they just haven't learned those words yet? Let's go on to the second one. Uh, the second one, you have to type the missing letters to complete the text below. So here we have a, a short text and we have the first letter or the first two letters of a word. And then you have to uh, type the letters to complete those words. And you can see that the candidate is required to do a little bit more than the first example. They actually have to try and understand the full sentence uh, in order to work out which word goes in that particular gap. They need to know spelling, so it tests their spelling ability. So there are, are some good benefits to this test. It does very much focus on grammar and vocab. So if you want to test grammar and vocab, particularly if it's from a limited range of things that you have been covering in class, for example, then it may be a good test for you. But it's not necessarily testing reading at a wider level. And it may be that we do want to test reading at a wider level. So the top uh, example on this next slide, uh, you have to read the short text that's on the left. It really is a very short text. And then match the sentence A, B or C that has the correct um, meaning as what can be found in that reading text to the left. So here it still requires that ability to understand sentences just at the sentence level. It still requires an understanding of gra grammar and vocabulary, 
but hopefully you can see it's doing it in a slightly different way. It's testing whether you can match ultimately synonyms in, if not words, then ideas. And so there's a little bit, let's say, expansion of the reading context there. And then this bottom example here, uh, you've got some pictures of people on the left. Again, it's very small. You don't need to be able to see it, but just let me explain the task. You've got pictures of the people on the left uh, and there's a, a paragraph describing the, the person and what they want. In this case, what they're looking for in a market. And then on the right hand side, we have other paragraphs about the different sorts of markets that these people can go to. And again, we're trying to match the person with the paragraph about which market they would prefer to go to. So it's a matching activity. And here we obviously need to understand grammar and vocabulary, but we're also trying to understand the main idea of this paragraph. We also may need to make inferences in what we're reading. There's not a direct to direct um, match here. We have to um, infer uh, what is being written in this paragraph and the next paragraph. And so hopefully you can see this is, again, another expansion of that reading construct. And so different task types for different candidates, different purposes, depending on whether we want to drill down into something specific, whether we want to test more generally, um, and also what level the candidate is. So you can see that bottom example requires a higher level of cognition. So we're not going to give this to a five-year-old, for example, who's only just started learning language. So both in terms of cognition, but also linguistic ability, obviously. So that's just to whet your appetite of some different sorts of task types and how it's very important to think about your task type and whether it's important, uh, whether it's relevant, whether it's accessible to your candidature. Here is some, here are some examples of speaking task types now. So in this speaking activity, it's a simple read aloud activity. Uh, there are six sentences and the candidate simply needs to read that sentence aloud. So that is testing their speaking ability, that's testing their pronunciation, um, their fluency in terms of this particular sentence. If we go on, here's another speaking task type. And here we have a picture or pictures for the candidate to describe. So they are producing language here. In that first example we saw, it was only testing the recognition of language. Can they recognize the words that are put in front of them? And can they say it? But here we're going a bit uh, further and we're asking the candidate to produce language. There's no words on screen there. There's just a picture. So they have to look at the picture and describe it. Um, and here we've got two pictures. So it's, it's a sequence of events or pictures may be compared against one another. And so that requires the test taker to be able to describe and to, to think more. So again, it taps into cognitive abilities as well as linguistic. And here's another example. Uh, here, this is a discussion with a partner. So there are two people taking this test and their instruction is to discuss uh, between one another, is it a good idea for students to go on school trips and there are some ideas uh, around. So it does give them some language, but it's testing their ability to speak, to use that language and to come up with more ideas. And it's testing not just production, but their ability to interact with one another as well. Uh, so it's interaction. So three different sorts of speaking tests. Now, I hope you haven't fallen asleep. What I'd like you to do now is tell me which of those speaking tests you like the best. Which do you think is best to test speaking? So if you can put a one or a two or a three in the chat, please, as to which, which test, which of those tests you think is best. So one or two or three, 
up to you. Which one do you personally think is best? And let me have a look at the test, uh, at the chat, sorry. See what you were thinking. Okay, so we have twos and threes, threes, twos, threes, twos. Okay, great. Okay, so lots of twos and threes, it seems to me. Fantastic. Three or two, depending on who you are testing. And it depends on the level of the student. Yeah, so some good answers there. Okay, so what is the answer? The answer is it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on who you are testing. It depends what they want to get out of the test. But I agree to some extent that two and then three is more developed. It's arguably more authentic. Uh, it requires more and it requires more speaking skills as well as those additional skills that go with the linguistics such as the um, cognitive but also the social uh, even the cultural potentially as well um, and that is because it's based on a, a real life scenario that's the ultimate construct the model that we are trying to assess however number one could also be very useful and relevant as well um, it's often used um, by call centers for example call center staff need to be able to read out key passages um, and so test number one may be very appropriate for that particular audience so there's not one right answer. It does depend, uh, but you can see the different sorts of tests and, and how certain tests test more in one test than another. Okay, um, we are nearing the end now, but just to finish up with a few other things that we also need to think about uh, when we are developing our tests. Uh, we also need a mark scheme. So how are we going to mark? How are we going to score? How are we going to reward performance on a test? Mark schemes are needed actually for all tests, but it's particularly needed for productive skills as well. So here, for example, we have a mark scheme for a speaking test. It comes from the IELTS test, which is a, a very widely used test of academic uh, language in the world. And here uh, we see that the speaking construct has been divided into four different areas. Again, apologies, it's very small on screen, but you can see that the marker is rewarding the candidates for fluency and coherence, lexical resource, so vocabulary, grammatical range and accuracy, and pronunciation. So for whatever reason, these are four key areas that uh, the test makers of IELTS have deemed to be important for their candidature. And the examiners are using these descriptors uh, to help them give a candidate the right score, to help them assess the candidate, to help them judge accurately and fairly. And therefore, these examiners need to be trained well. They need to be standardised so that each examiner marks in the same way. They need to be continually monitored to make sure that each examiner is marking in the right way to ensure reliability and accuracy. They need to obviously therefore be reliable. They need to be consistent uh, so the way they personally marked last time is the same that they marked this time, consistent with themselves, but also consistent with the other raters, the other markers. And very importantly, they need to be neither, neither harsh nor lenient in the marks that they are awarding. Now, nowadays, we also use auto markers as well as human markers. And the automarkers also need to be trained, standardised, monitored, reliable, consistent, and neither harsh nor lenient. And automarkers nowadays have been trained on lots and lots of data. It uses AI and machine learning to be able to hopefully give an accurate result. Um, 
and we are sort of part way through that. Auto marking is developed to an extent where we can use it in certain contexts, but it's not super, super accurate in some other context. And so right at the moment in 2023, we often think a good mixture of both humans and auto markings is perhaps a good way to do that. And on the masters, we'll look into technology in one whole module. Um, so we really get into how and, and if we should and could, can use technology in language assessment. So finally, to conclude, I hope one thing that you've got out of this talk is when we are considering how to develop a language assessment, we need to think, is it fit for purpose, fit for the people who are going to take the test, fit for the contexts that they find themselves in, fit for what they want to do with the scores when they get the scores. And we often talk about VRIPQ. This is a term that will come up in module six, and it's an acronym to help us think about key aspects that are useful in developing tests. So the V is for validity. Is the test valid? Is it fit for purpose? So that sort of encompasses all of it. We think about reliability. Is are the results of the test reliable? Can we rely on them? Are they always going to give the same candidate the same mark under the same circumstances? We think about the test's impact. The test and the test results will have an impact on individuals to a greater or lesser extent. And we obviously want to make sure that that impact is positive and does not have any negative impact. And it's not just the test takers themselves, but the people and the organizations who recognize the scores, it has an impact on them. It even has an impact on society and countries as a whole, on educational systems. The P is practicality. We need to think about uh, do we have the resources to run this test? How are we actually going to conduct the test? That's obviously a very important thing because a test may be wonderfully reliable and wonderfully valid, but it's too expensive to administer. And so that's a factor as well. And ultimately, all of that is about quality. It's about fit for purpose. It's about can we come up with a quality assessment that is going to be good for the test taker, for the classroom, for the teacher, for the organisation who recognises the score or uh, any stakeholder involved in that process. So finally, you have your test, you have your cake. Here's my daughter cutting into it and enjoying it. So I hope that's been useful for you. It just gives you a taster of some of the things that we will talk about on in particular module six of the masters and hopefully you will want to explore a lot of these themes a lot further in greater depth on the master's program. So um, amazingly for me, I think we are <laughs> wonderfully on time. That's remarkable. And so we do have 10, quest uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I will hand back to Alice now, but I will uh, stay on the line. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. That was really, really interesting. Um, so as Graham says, well, we've got 10 minutes to um, answer some questions. Um, so if you haven't submitted your question yet, then please do so. Um, we've got a few that have come through. So um, we'll start with uh, the first one, which is uh, regarding the flexibility of the MST. So will I be able to study flexibly online or is there a strict teaching timetable? Uh, I think that's a question. Shall I try to yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, I'm not entirely sure that I know what the question is. Of course, a lot of the uh, the learning will happen um, at your own pace in, you, you know, this from week to week. It's down to you to determine what your learning timetable will be. Um, but whenever we offer um, sessions, they will happen at a specific time, of course. Um, and they will, they are, the, the timing of them, is um, carefully designed um, to make sure that the, po the program progresses at a good pace, but also that all of the different um, aspects of it fit together very well. I don't know if that answers the question that was asked. Yeah, I think I think that's great. Thank you. 
Um, so the next one, I think maybe for you again, Brecha, um, do I need to have studied linguistics to gain a place on the master's? No, not at all. Um, the, the whole um, idea of the master's is um, that we want to make sure that people really do know about language. And so a little bit of linguistics does come into it. Um, and that is what the first module is about. Um, but the point of it is exactly because we assume that people don't know about linguistics and perhaps their knowledge um, about languages is fairly limited. Um, and that's why we're offering it. So it's absolutely not necessary, no. Thank you. Um, just a few more that come through. So um, how much interaction will I get with other students on the course? Um, there's interaction, um, of course, a lot of interaction um, during the residentials, um, but we make sure that you also meet one another um, long before then and in between the residentials. And this is in various shapes. It can be um, with regular meetings that you have with the course director who checks in with everyone. Um, and this is partly in, in, in groups. Um, and then, of course, we have um, things like um, supervision type teaching uh, where you, you see a tutor, which will also often happens um, in, in small groups. And then, of course, we encourage um, students to talk to each other outside uh, the teaching environment anyway. Um, we have the um, virtual learning environment um, that is um, specifically designed um, to, um, to help facilitate that. Um, but we hope that students will also communicate outside um, purely the offerings that we give. Thank you. Um, what can I do to prepare for the interview? Should I be invited? <laughs> That's another very good question. Um, I, I think it would help to, to think about um, what your background is um, and how you think, um, what, what is relevant in terms of what you will be able to bring to your learning on the course, um, regardless of how much of, of that involves assessment um, or not. But we want to know whether you've thought about what makes you someone who is likely to be successful on our course. Um, so it's not about learning, but necessarily doing learning before you come to the course, but just think about what you already know. and. Of course, we also want to know um, how you think the course is going to help you um, develop um, professionally in the future, or potentially if you're interested in doing further research, um, what that might be. So we want to explore um, what your interests are. So it's just a matter of thinking about the, the various things that, that you think are relevant in terms of um, the, the course and what makes you a suitable candidate so that you can talk about that. So there's no new work that you will need to do in order to prepare for the interview. Thank you. Um, and a question that's come through, Graham, this one might be for you. Um, is there a resource you would recommend for possible assessment tasks that we can access and analyze? Um, yeah, there are there are many uh, resources out there. I think I would point you to the Alte website. Alte is the Association of Language Testers in Europe. Um, so they obviously deal with English language tests, but but wider uh, other language tests as, as well. Uh, and they have a really good resources page. And on that resources page, they have a document called the Manual for Language Test Development. Um, and examining something like that. I can't, I can't remember the manual for language test development. Um, and that's a really good resource that looks at uh, different sorts of assessment tasks, um, goes through a few of those things that I was talking about today and, and is a very practical hands on document about how to actually create assessment tasks uh, for your purpose. So do